right, we'll go ahead and we will get started. We'll start with a prayer from the Psalms. So if you open with me to Psalm 40. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the roll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So... Tonight, uh, we are shifting gears again. Last week, we talked about the Psalms, which were more about a book of prayer and how to pray with the scriptures. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a different genre of biblical literature, the prophets. Okay, so first of all, what is prophecy? Okay, prophecy, uh, who here thinks prophecy is telling the future? Okay, uh, that's, that's commonly what we think, right? That prophecy is telling the future. And that's one of the meanings of prophecy. It looks into the future of what's to come. But a prophet is simply someone who speaks God's word. And God's word can be about the future, but it can also be about the present. And sometimes that's way more interesting because prophets tend to reveal things that everybody's thinking, but they don't want to say out loud. <laughs> it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes. How many read the emperor's new clothes? Or sorry, it's, it, so remember the story, right? The, the, fairy, the fairy tale where, where somebody tricks the king into wearing nothing, right? Because he's like, oh, look at this fine thing. Only wise people can see it. You can see it, right? Oh, sure, I can see it, right? But what it is is a fable about our own time, right? That many people just go along with things to fit in, right? So we see very clearly that the prophets are those who kind of are the little boy in the crowd that say, but the king is naked. <laughs> and they're like, no, shush, he's, don't you see these fine clothes? And we're like, no, he's not wearing anything, right? So prophets are the ones who are not afraid to endure the ridicule of people for speaking the truth, right? So do you think we have some prophets today in our world? Yes, and, and in fact, that's the, the call of every Christian person is to speak the truth with love. And when you do so, uh, it's not gonna be popular. And in fact, the lives of the prophets were not very popular either, okay? So we look at that. But first, I wanna do a recap of where we were because we did it really quickly, the Davidic covenant. We, when we were in Kings two weeks ago, right? The first book of Kings, where we saw that the, the conclusion of the Davidic covenant was that David's throne is firmly established. God promises him, forever I will set one of your descendants upon the throne and I will build you a house. You wanna build me a house, but I will build you one. Your house will be forever firm. Solomon then builds the temple. And so that's a picture of Solomon there building the temple and it's established and it's firm. And so everything seems great. The son of David's on the throne. They built the temple and it doesn't even last through his lifetime because we see that he commits idolatry because he had many wives who worshiped many different gods and he ended up building pagan temples to them too. So he is no longer faithful to God and God says, this is terrible. For the sake of my love for David, I won't split up the kingdom in your lifetime, but it's gonna happen during the time of your son, okay? So we see that happen immediately after the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam uh, splits the kingdom because he's not very wise. And then we see that the, the Northern 10 tribes, they go up and they form their own worship. They start making two golden calves, not just one, but two, and they start worshiping false gods, right? And the, only there are two tribes left in the South, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. They stay with, King, with the son of David and everybody else says, we're, we're done with David because we don't like him, okay? Now that situation gets worse and worse and that's played out in the books of First and Second Kings, okay? And then it goes all the way until uh, about 200 years later where the 10 northern tribes are destroyed 
by the Assyrians. So the Assyrians are a pagan nation. They come in and they completely wipe them out and they scatter the 10 tribes to the four winds. That's what we call the diaspora, where the Jews are scattered to the four winds and it's not sure whether they will ever be reunited. Okay. The southern kingdom lasts a little bit longer than that. So after about 350 years from the time of Solomon, then we see the Babylonian exile. The Babylonians come down, they capture them, and they burn the temple to the ground, and they carry them all away to Babylon. Okay? So we see, as we've seen with every covenant, right? you have the promise made, and then there's sin, and there's a fall, and then it's rebuilt. Right? So, so this pattern continues. The Davidic covenant was great, but it doesn't last. There's a fall because of idolatry. And then it leads to division and exile and slavery again. So now what do we do? During this period of time, we have a different kind of literature, the prophetic literature. There are prophets that God sends to remind them, hey, wake up, guys. Hey, I told you this would happen. <laughs> I told it to Moses. I told it to David. If you guys aren't faithful, this is what will happen to you. It's happening right now. Wake up. The solution is repentance. And so there are prophets that come in the early part of it saying, hey, guys, wake up. We don't have to be destroyed. It's OK. Like, please turn around but you probably won't, <laughs> you know. And so this is what's gonna happen when you don't, right? But you don't have to go there. But and then of course it happens. And then you have people who are prophesying during the time of the Babylonian exile to say, hey, return to the Lord, he'll bring us back. And then there's a period of prophets that come after the exile to help them rebuild. And say, hey, don't give up hope because they're looking at the wasteland of Jerusalem. They're saying, this is terrible. How will we ever get out of this? And I say, no, don't lose hope. Right? God will restore and he will be faithful to his promises, although it'll take a little bit of time. Right? So we're going to focus on, because it's Bible basics, we're only going to focus on the three big prophets. And I feel like it's a crime what I'm going to do tonight, because we could spend a whole semester on Isaiah alone, because Isaiah is so amazing, but we have to keep it, uh, keep it short. So we will, we will cover the biggest stuff. Um, what we see in Isaiah is Isaiah is like the fifth gospel. It has so much good stuff in it. And for all of you who are coming to Holy Week masses and for the Easter vigil, for those who are coming, all throughout Holy Week, we're gonna hear Isaiah, 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 all over the place. So what we see in Isaiah is a description about um, the failures of Israel, but also what's gonna happen in the future and what the Messiah is going to look like who comes. So let's look at a couple of things. One, one feature is in Isaiah 9, where it talks about how the son of David will come back, and what is he going to look like? Isaiah 9, if you turn with me, Isaiah 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Where have you heard that scripture before? Christmas time, that's right. Yes, we hear that song on Christmas because this is a prophecy about the Messiah, right? A son is born to us. And isn't that amazing? You say, what is, and it says, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So he's like Solomon shalom, peace. His peace, although like Solomon's peace only lasted during his lifetime, the peace that this son will bring, this son of David is going to be everlasting. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. There you have it. So there will be a new son of David and he is going to establish peace and his name is going to be mighty God. Now remember names are important, right? It's not like you name your child candy or flower today, right? I mean, the fact is when Jews named their children, it had a purpose. It was to reveal their identity, right? And so if a child is named Mighty God, that's pretty presumptuous, isn't it? Unless it's true. So this is a prophetic reference that in the future, there's going to be a child whose identity is going to be divine. And they're like, what does that mean? Well, we won't know until he comes. Right? That's why prophecy is really difficult. Some people, if you go online and you like see a bunch of YouTube videos, and they're like, oh, this prophecy, this is going to happen. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, it's so hard to do that, right? Because usually we only recognize a prophecy as true after it's happened, right? And this is one of those things. They're looking at it, how is it possible that there's going to be a child whose name is Mighty God? They had no idea how that was going to happen until Jesus came. And then we're like, oh, right? But there's, there's tons of other examples of that. So what's another a description of this uh, king who will come in the future? You skip ahead to Isaiah 11. 
There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out from his roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Recognize those from anywhere? Those who are studying confirmation, those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the son of David will have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, right? He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. Didn't we hear that reading today or yesterday at Mass? I judge rightly. I do not, you know, I, I, I judge what I see and my judgment is true, right? So we see Jesus is the one who judges with righteousness and truth. He will, with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. But he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips shall slay the wicked. So we see he's going to be faithful to the poor and those who are poor in spirit, but those who are proud, he will cast down, right? So all these themes are being laid out here in Isaiah. Uh, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little child to lead them. So now we're gonna have this king is gonna bring back a peace that we had in Eden, right? Where all the animals and people are together and they're not fighting, right? So this king, this son of David is going to have divine properties, he's gonna restore Eden. You see all these things that are being built up here? Okay. What's something else? If you skip ahead way far to Isaiah 42, I feel like this is a crime. Okay, all right. This is just, we're skipping so much good stuff, I can't even believe it. Um, Isaiah 42 talks about the servant of the Lord, the Messiah. What is he going to be like? Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations, will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He'll faithfully bring forth justice. All right, coming down farther to verse six. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. Isn't this interesting? How can a person be a covenant? Isn't that interesting? I give you as a covenant. This person is going to be a covenant. We've talked about covenants being that agreement, that relationship, extension of kinship by oath that we've seen in all the other covenants. How is it possible that a person can be that covenant? Interesting. Let's, we'll come back to that, maybe. <laughs> oh, you better believe we will. So then we come to Isaiah oh, 55. Good gravy. Okay. Well, well, don't worry, we'll, we'll come back for another one that's even really way better. Okay, so 55. This one is just so great. You've heard this one before. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, your labor for what does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. So the food I'm going to give is going to come through the ear. Isn't that interesting? Listening to the word of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? So we see very clearly the word of God needs to be our food. And if in fact we listen to it with faith, it will give us eternal life, right? So amazing. Again, I will make with you an everlasting covenant, talking to the people, my steadfast, merciful love for David. So now we see this covenant is going to be everlasting. Unlike the other ones that were temporary, this one's going to last forever, okay? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he may be near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy on him and to our God who will pardon. So this is a merciful king and a merciful judge, but we got to turn around. And again, he's talking in the context of exile as well, right? You guys are going to come back. But if you do, he will take you back, right? Okay. So that's some things with, with Isaiah. So we see if the poor and thirsty come to him and eat, God will make an everlasting covenant with them. So anyone who comes to the son of David and eats a divine meal with him becomes part of a covenant. Isn't that interesting? I wonder where that's going to lead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just, I was doing a little prophetic foreshadowing over here, right? Anyone who comes to the son of David and eats who is hungry and thirsty will enter into the new relationship with the king. Usually it had to be before the Israelite people, and now it's going to be anyone who's thirsty, anyone who is hungry can come. So that's a foretaste of things to come. But we see that 
people who are reading this at the time don't really get it, right? That's why you have people resisting that idea that Jesus is talking to the Gentiles because they're like, he can't really be serious that this is for everybody. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, so there's way more stuff in Isaiah, which we will come back to maybe at the end of class if we have time. We have to go to Jeremiah. Oh, I feel so bad. Okay. All right, so Jeremiah. Jeremiah is... Um, you know, whereas Isaiah is kind of like the top 40 radio, you know, like all the time, like you hear songs all the time. Jeremiah is like the blues, right? Everything's bad. Uh, we're not going to get out of it. Uh, woe is us. Um, you guys blew it and we're not getting out of here, right? Um, and Jeremiah is a type of Jesus because he's a young guy and um, he's cut off in his prime. Everybody hates him. They plot to kill him. And uh, he's just trying to, he's just trying to help. I'm just trying to help out, guys. <laughs> you know? But they don't listen to him. And so he becomes an image of Jesus being rejected uh, by those he came to help, all right? So let's look at, at Jeremiah. He mostly focuses on Israel's failures to follow God. Um, we see this very clearly in the beginning. Yeah, so we see this in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. It says, has a nation changed its gods, even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doesn't profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolated, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Right? So he said, first of all, I had a living fountain that I'm feeding them with, giving them nourishment. They left that, and they tried to find a well over here, right? Dumb because I have water over here, but they tried to dig a hole for themselves to find water and it doesn't work, it's a broken well. That's a great image for idolatry, the abandoning the living God to go for something that's broken and doesn't work, right? But that's what they keep doing. So they say, why is, he, why is Israel a slave? Because they keep on abandoning God. So this is, this is the main theme of, of, uh, of Jeremiah and he's also railing against the priests because the priests are the main problem, right? So he says this in, in Jeremiah chapter three, verse 15, a little bit before, it says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. When you multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, they will no longer say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel and together they shall come from the land of the north, the land I gave your fathers for heritage. So here we have... In the future, I'm going to give you righteous shepherds because you've been having wicked priests. So Jesus, the true high priest, is going to come. He's going to restore the priesthood and he's going to reunite all the tribes. So the house in the north is called the house of Israel. The house in the south is called the house of Judah. So he's going to reunite everybody that was exiled and spread apart. You see what's happening here? We're prophesying that this Messiah that's coming, he's going to heal the divisions. Okay. Now we come to uh, Jeremiah, the chapters 30 through 33 are really the consolation chapters because most of the rest of it is promising there's gonna be doom and gloom everywhere. But chapters 30 through 33 are really great because then we have some real profound promises. All right, so chapter 31. Chapter 31, verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and who has labor pains together, a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they will come and with consolations I will lead them back. I'll make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it in the islands afar off. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather them and will keep them as a shepherd keeps his flock. Okay, so skipping ahead. I will turn their mourning into joy. And then we get right to the end of the chapter 31. Chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, and I showed them myself their master. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and say to his brother, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. 
says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. This passage, Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, is remarkable because it's the only place in the Old Testament where we get that phrase, new covenant. It's the only place. Now, when Jesus in Luke 22 says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he's making a direct reference to Jeremiah 31, right here, okay? This cup, this is the new covenant in my blood, which will unite the house of Judah and Israel again. And it also will be part of that, that it will write the law inside. The old covenant in Moses, it was written on tablets of stone, and those were broken, because it was something external. But I'm gonna write it on your heart. So you can't lose it anymore. You can't break it anymore. I'm gonna put it something deep within you, right? And that's what happens on the day of Pentecost when they're cut to the heart and the power of the Holy Spirit comes and inscribes the law right there. Okay, all right. And unlike the Mosaic covenant that was broken, it says this one won't be broken and everyone will know me. And how will they know me? Because they're gonna experience forgiveness of their sins. And this is why confession is so amazing. This is why baptism is so amazing because when we experience the power of God's forgiveness for us, it changes us. How many of you have ever experienced forgiveness in your life for yourself? Isn't that amazing? Like when you know that you blew it and somebody forgives you, it's the greatest feeling in the world, right? You know, you don't deserve it and they give it to you. It's amazing. It's remarkable. And we see that this is what God desires. He wants each and every person to know his forgiveness for them so that they, they know who he is, that he's good, and he's not a wicked God, he's not a God who's angry with them, he's a God who loves them, right? Okay, that's Jeremiah. Whew, there's way more for Jeremiah, but let's uh, jump ahead a little bit. And now we come to Ezekiel. Right, now Ezekiel is a priest. So the other two guys, they weren't priests. Ezekiel a lot of his visions, he's like rated our book, by the way, okay? So Ezekiel, um, there are certain prophecies that are very graphic and the Jews actually forbade certain people to read them without a, without a tutor because they're very disturbing images, right? There are certain chapters that, that are kind of disturbing prophetic images. But a lot of the things that Ezekiel sees, they're related to the temple imagery, right? So in fact, the last several chapters of Ezekiel are describing a new temple that's gonna come in the future. And it's not a real temple because the dimensions are stylized, they're not real, like they, they wouldn't work. Like there's no vertical dimensions, there's only horizontal dimensions, so it doesn't tell you where the roof is. So he's meant to give you that idea. This is something that is a spiritual reality he's talking about. But if we look in, in, uh, in Ezekiel, there's a lot of doom and gloom in this one, but there's also some consoling passages from Ezekiel 40 onward. But let's look at Ezekiel 34 first. So let's go ahead and jump ahead to Ezekiel 34. If you're trying to follow along in pages and you have this one for those pagans who can't find it, uh, it's, it's uh, 721 at the bottom there. Okay. Okay. All right, 722 is what we're gonna be looking at. Okay. So here we have in Ezekiel 34, 11 and following, it says, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when some of his sheep have been scattered abroad, so will I seek out my sheep. So he's talking about the diaspora. They're all scattered. Uh, God himself is gonna bring them back, okay? Then we go to verse 14, it says, I will feed them with good pasture and upon the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they will lie down in good grazing land and on fat pasture they will feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Now remember when Jesus, he went up on the mountain and he sat the people down and they lied on the grass. He began to teach them. <laughs> and then he feeds the 5,000. <laughs> it's all this stuff, it's happening, right? So then, boo. okay, so then we continue going on. It says, I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strayed, will bind the crippled, I will strengthen the weak, the fat and the strong I will watch over. I will feed them in justice. Right, as for you, my flock, says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, rams and goats. Does Jesus have a parable about judging between sheep and goats? Yes, he does, <laughs> see? Puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, right? All these things, they're imagery Jesus is pulling on, saying that I'm the judge, I'm the one who's doing this, I'm the shepherd. And then we skip down until verse 23, 22, it says, I will save my flock, they will no longer be prey, I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, isn't this interesting? In verse 15, he said, I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. 
And then in verse 23, he says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. How can God be the shepherd and David be the shepherd at the same time? the son of God is also the son of David, unless he is the hypostatic union, the divine nature and the human nature together. Isn't that amazing? All these things that seem like contradictions in the Old Testament, like how is that possible? God said he'd do it and David would be it. Which is it? It's both. In a way we could have never imagined that has never been done before and never will be done again in the future. Woo! Isn't that great? The prophets are amazing, friends. We've got, that's why you need to know. The, it's what we said today oh, in, in, the, in the daily reading. Oh, by the, do we still have it? Ugh. Where's the daily reading? Ah, that would have been a great segue. Okay, the daily reading for today, it says, Jesus, he's telling the, the, the Pharisees, and he says to you, you know, you should believe Moses because he wrote about me. Like, if you don't know the scriptures, then you don't know about me, right? That's why we have the Old Testament class is because when you read the Old Testament, you realize every single page is Jesus, 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 Jesus all the time. Everything, especially the prophets. Okay. All right. Now, Ezekiel 34, 24, 25. Okay. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. That hasn't been possible since Eden, right? <laughs> So this is, again, renewal of the peace with all of creation, okay? All right, let's see what else we got going on here. All right, so then we come to Ezekiel 36, which talks about getting a new heart and a new spirit, okay? All right, so in verse 22, we reminded that this is not because we deserved it. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, right? I'm not doing this because you guys somehow deserve it, but because I'm good. That's why I'm doing it, right? Which you profaned among the nations to which you came. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned and which you profaned among them, etc. Verse 24, I will take you from the nations, gather you from the countries and bring you to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take out your flesh, the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to observe my commands. You shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. All right? So we have here clearly water cleansing ritual, right? Baptism, I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you. Confirmation, right? So we see very clearly all of the sacramental catechesis that our catechumens and con uh, confirmandi are about to receive, right? It's really, really remarkable. And this is really when we get to the heart of it, we recognize the reason why the old law wasn't capable of doing what it set out to do is because it remained an external thing. The Lord says, I don't want the law to be external to you. I want it to be inside of you. That was the purpose from the beginning, but they didn't get the message. So the Holy Spirit needs to come and inscribe the law in your heart so you can follow it and give you the power to do it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It gives you the power to live a Christian life because it's hard. When you're living in the world, people don't like it to live a Christian life because it requires sacrifice and you need the power of grace to do this. Okay, but it's there. All right. Now, the, the, the last piece that we'll cover here that's going to be amazing when the Messiah comes is in chapter 37, and this one will blow your socks off. Whew, wait for this. Chapter 37, verse 12. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I'll bring you home to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Now, do you remember what happened after the resurrection? Not just Jesus rose from the dead, but actually they saw dead people walking around Jerusalem because people were rising out of the graves spontaneously. Check out the end of the, of the Gospels. It's really, it's really remarkable. People saw some of the dead walking around because it started as a first fruits, but resurrection life is going to be a part of the new covenant. It's going to be a regular occurrence. And this is 
foreshadowing of the fact that we're not going to die forever. Like death is only uh, the end of this chapter and the beginning of eternity with God, right? So remarkable. Okay. And lastly, David's going to reign forever. So here we come to verse 24 of chapter 37. It says, my servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. They shall follow my ordinances and be careful to observe my statutes. They'll dwell in the land I gave your fathers, my servant Jacob, and they and their children, their children's children. And my David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I'll make a covenant with peace, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I'll bless them and multiply them. will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My dwelling place will be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay, so this is remarkable. It's saying, first of all, Ezekiel, as we wrote up here, it's like, he's going to give a new heart. He's going to give a new spirit. There's going to be the sanctuary in the midst of them that'll last forever, and the covenant will be everlasting. All the other ones have been broken, but he's saying this one will never be broken. Good news. How's that going to be possible? Well, again, prophecy isn't clear until it happens. So we will see how that happens. So let's go ahead and we'll turn this over, and you'll get to see uh, the imagery here <clears throat> to help make that a little bit clearer. <clears throat> Or maybe not. If you read the chapter, of course, you'll recognize the new covenant is kind of drawn in dotted lines. So we have the dotted line for the mountain, right? Because it hasn't happened yet. It says Mount Zion is going to be restored. It said, I will lift up, Mount Zion will be raised up above the hills. Above every other mountain, it'll be highly exalted, right? And we see that in the Psalms. Why are you jealous, other mountains of Mount Zion where God has chosen to dwell, right? So God is going to raise up Zion so it is a light and a beacon to all the nations where they're going to be dri driven to. King David, of course, is going to be, uh, the new son of David is going to return, who will have an everlasting kingdom. So we see him drawn in dotted lines. So again, this guy right here is a prophet. So those are the prophets all together, kind of like just talking about it. But everything else has not happened yet. Then, of course, you see a spiritual temple, which has a river flowing out of it. And this is also at the end of Ezekiel. We see Ezekiel's vision of the temple is that there's a river flowing out of the temple that gets wider and wider the farther it goes. Now, that's not a natural river, is it? Because natural rivers don't get more and more water the farther away from the source they get unless there's other rivers. There's only one river. So this is an image. Something is going to happen from this temple that it's going to get more and more broad as it goes. Right? <laughs> Wait for next week. I won't spoil it now. Right? But essentially what we see in these components of the new covenant, what it's going to look like. You're going to have a new Zion. We have a Davidic king who, as we said, is mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. How, what's that going to look like? He's going to look like God, right? We don't know how that's possible yet. There's going to be a new temple that's going to last forever because the old temple was flattened by the Babylonians, right? And then it's flattened again later on in the time of the Maccabees, right? So we recognize that, okay, um, this would be nice to have a temple that can't be flattened again. <laughs> Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. And they're like, how can you do that, right? Ah, but he was speaking to them of the temple of his body, which now can never be destroyed because it is resurrected and glorified and in heaven, and it can never be destroyed. Amazing. And God will dwell among his people. He's right over here. His sanctuary is in the midst of his people, and God will always dwell with them. Hallelujah. Are you people getting it? This is the mystery of our lives. And this is the thing we should be proclaiming from the housetops. That God is not in the heavens somewhere waiting for you. He's right here. Why is this place not day and night full? Packed to the rafters. People pressing in so that they're almost crushing each other. Because we don't believe. Simple answer. If we really believed that God was here, we would reorder our whole life around him. That's what Catholic life is meant to be. It's not coming to Mass for an hour on Sunday and looking at our watch and hoping it will be over sooner, you know. That shows we have no concept of what is happening here in this building. Because, friends, there's something happening in this church there's something that happens in every Catholic church throughout the world where the Blessed Sacrament is that doesn't happen anywhere in the universe. In the universe. There's something happening here that's more tremendous than black holes being formed. Something more tremendous than supernova. Something more tremendous than stuff in this space that we can't understand. What is it? 
the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the shepherd of Israel, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who died for your sins, who came in the flesh, the new son of David, who came and reconciled all people to himself in his body, offers you a banquet. And for those who are hungry and thirsty and come to eat and to drink, they will be entered into that covenant that will never be broken. Should a mother forget her child, I will never forsake you, also from Isaiah. (laughs) This is the promise of God. That is why the martyrs and the saints throughout history have died for this. I mean, uh, no saint, uh, is it Tarsisius, the boy saint of the Eucharist? Yes, uh, you're making sure I'm look, nodding heads, you know him. Is that tar- Tarsisius? Yes, the little boy? Yeah, okay, so Tarsisius, right? Early, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's this. If somebody correct me if it's not Tarsisius, okay? The little boy who was carrying the blessed sacrament to the sick. Is this him? Yes, good, thank you. Okay, good, I'm going nod. Okay, somebody... Sometimes I remember names and it's the wrong name. Okay, so it happens. I've had a a rough week. Okay, so anyway. So Sargisius, this little boy, he's carrying communion to the sick. And there's some other boys around him who are like, hey, what do you got there? And he's like, he wouldn't show them. No, hey, what do you got there? And they beat him up and they beat him up and beat him up until he died. He wouldn't reveal what it was. And then when they opened opened up, it was gone. Like he had consumed the host to protect it from being profaned by others, right? He was a martyr for the Eucharist. There's many others, you know, who have been martyrs for the Eucharist throughout the centuries, right? During, I mean, it's just, it, we, we have to look and see, friends, is this worth your life? You know, you're free to believe it or not, but what we're claiming is something really radical. When you look at the prophets and you look at what Jesus did, there's something really tremendous that's happening here at every Mass. And with, even in between Mass, the afterglow of that. Why wouldn't you give your life for that? That's why I became a priest, because I became convinced. And once you become convinced, you can't unsee it. You can deny it, but you can't unsee it once you've seen it. So friends, I I just invite you, I, I really do, to just come to know him, because his kingdom will have no end, and this covenant will never be broken unless you run away from it. It's stable, and it's here. And that's what's so beautiful, because when you sin, the Lord's saying, I'm still faithful, come back. I'm not giving up on you. Come back. I didn't uh, stutter, did I? (laughs) I said, I will always pardon you your iniquities. And you'll know me. Everyone will know me. That's why we have the sacraments. So that you can know him. And you don't have to stay far away. Even if you've done the worst thing you can imagine. If you come back to him, he will take you back. That's what the prophets tell us. Next week, we're going to go through chapter 7. And I, I, kind of, I, I kind of accelerated the timeline a bit because I wanted us to finish the book before Easter for all of our catechumens and canons that are going to be um, receiving sacraments. So next week, we will cover chapter 7. And then during Holy Week, we won't necessarily get to the lesson. We won't have homework during Holy Week. The homework, I want you guys to come to as many Masses as you can during Holy Week. Because when you come to the Masses of Holy Week, you're going to find that Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are really prominent. Isaiah is literally every day from Palm Sunday up through the Easter Vigil. There's a reading from Isaiah. So if you look in your, your books, I mean, we've got Isaiah 50 on Palm Sunday, we've got Isaiah 42 on Monday, 49 on Tuesday, Isaiah 50 on Wednesday, Isaiah 61 on Holy Thursday, Isaiah 52 on Good Friday. Like, there's just so many beautiful things. If you start reading through those scriptures, that's going to be your homework. Even if you don't come to the Masses, I want you to read the daily Mass readings for Holy Week when you get to it, because it's just, it is a whole beautiful catechesis on who Jesus is and what he's done for you. So you need to be reminded. We all need to be reminded. And then on, on the Easter Vigil, there's two from Isaiah, Isaiah 54 and 55, and then Ezekiel is going to talk about the new heart and the new spirit. So some of these scriptures we covered, if you come to the Easter Vigil, you're going to hear them again, which we can never hear them enough. And when we see them played out in front of us. It's remarkable, especially for those nine people who are going to be baptized, I think, and a few more that are coming into the church, right? So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful time for us. Um, at this point, uh, we can dismiss those who are going to RCIA. Um, I don't really have questions this week. I, I thank you for those who've been praying for for me and my brother. My brother, for those who didn't hear, he 
he, has a, he had two brain tumors. Um, he had tumors in high school and they were in remission, um, but they came back 10 years later and so he had emergency surgery. He just got out of surgery about an hour ago. Uh, and so the doctor, about two hours ago, and the doctors seem to think that it went well, but please continue to pray for him. His name is Michael and pray for the family because it's been a rough week. Uh, but uh, you can come up with your own questions about the prophets and then uh, the youth uh, can, will be here and we'll, uh, we'll begin with some, some prayer and other things. So break and then we'll be back in here for when you're done with your small groups and we'll conclude with some prayer. Okay, good, well, it's great to see all of you. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, before we do some prayer time together, I want to just open up if there are any questions that you have, either about tonight or about any of the course, or if you had any other questions that you wanted to ask that didn't fit into anything, but you just wanted to ask, uh, yes. And somebody can just be a runner for me. Thanks. So if I said, video games won't solve all the problems in your life, then I would, and everybody hated me, then I would be a prophet? Ah, uh, good question. No, you have to be right first. <laughs> video games has never solved anybody's problems, and so you'd be a false prophet. Yeah, so, man, people wouldn't, people wouldn't hate you. They would agree with you. A lot, oh, they won't, yes. No, that's true. I mean, uh, the fact, yeah, I thought you said that they will fix all the problems in your life. So, yeah, no, I misunderstood. Yes, yeah, so if, if you kind of said, yeah, um, you're going against the grain because a lot of people think that if I just distract myself with entertainment all day long, I'm going to be happy. Well, look at the depression and suicide rates to, to say that's not true, right? We know that it's not true, but we tend to keep doing it, right? Good. Other questions? Thank you. Yes. No. If there's no questions, I was going to share a little bit about, about prayer tonight. Um, but uh, I want to just open that up if you had any, uh, any other questions you wanted to ask. Because this is our time together. If you got a captive audience, if you want, if you want a priest to ask any questions, you can. Okay. All right. No questions? All right. No questions. All right. Good. Not a problem. So tonight, tonight, folks, I wanted to share a new prayer with you. We've been doing some music the last couple of times. Um, I want to share with you a different kind of rosary. Uh, because some of you, how many of you pray the regular rosary? How many of you have heard of the Seven Sorrows Rosary? Okay, a couple, all right. How many of you have ever prayed the Seven Sorrows Rosary before? Okay, all right. So Seven Sorrows Rosary looks a little bit different. Um, looks like this. Basically, it's got seven sets of seven instead of five sets of 10. So it's got one fewer Hail Mary. That's, if you do your math, seven times seven is 49, right? Normal Rosary is 50. So it's one less uh, Hail Mary, but there's seven mysteries and they're focused on the tears of Our Lady. There are certain events in the life of Mary that were places of sorrow for her, okay? I talked about this at, at Mass probably about a year ago or maybe two, I don't remember when I, when I preached on it last, but the Seven Sorrows Rosary is really beautiful. Um, I was going to do some homework on it before, but today has been crazy, <laughs> but I'll do, I'll do my best of what I remember. But, but ultimately, the purpose of the Seven Sorrows Rosary is the healing of our hearts and the healing of our sadness. It's kind of, it seems counterintuitive, but when we comfort somebody in their sadness, our sadness gets better. 
Ever notice that when like you're consoling a friend who's having a hard time that you experience peace, right? Sometimes that's just the case. And so what the purpose of this is when we meditate on the things that caused Our Lady sorrow, it's like back door, it gives her permission to come into our hearts and heal the places where we're hurting. And I'll, I'll share how this works. So the first mystery is the prophecy of Simeon. So that was the event where Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple and Simeon raises him in his arms and says, now you can let your servant go in peace. My own eyes have seen the salvation you prepared inside of your people. But then he says something really difficult. He says, this child is destined for the rise and the fall of many in Israel and will be a sign that will be contradicted. And you yourself, talking to Mary, a sword will pierce your heart. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, right? So what mom likes to hear that their son is gonna be rejected and a sign of contradiction and she's gonna suffer? She doesn't know what that's gonna look like, but it's a place of suffering, right? Sometimes you get a bad, like my brother, he gets a diagnosis, right? You're gonna suffer. That's not a good news situation, right? There's a hundred different ways that can play out in your life. But when we meditate on Our Lady suffering and try and console her, somehow she enters into that place that we're maybe even not aware of that we're hurting. Another example, uh, f losing Jesus for three days in Jerusalem, right? Any of you ever lost a younger brother or sister in the shopping mall, right? Were you ever lost in the shopping mall <laughs> right? when you were a kid, right? It's a terrifying thing when you're a parent and you lose your kid, right? Or when you get lost, terrifying thing. Imagine that for three days they lost Jesus. For three days you lost Jesus, right? Where is he? I don't know. Maybe he's dead. Maybe he got kidnapped. I have no idea. Where'd he go? Have you ever had one of your siblings run away from home and not tell everybody where they were or just disappear for a couple hours? couple days it's horrendous but it's even worse sometimes the worst loneliness is when we feel like god we've lost him because imagine they lost this is the first time in their life it's been it's been practically 12 years when they took him to the temple he's 12 years old for 12 years of their life they've never been without jesus and then for the first time they lose him they've had god in their house for 12 years and all of a sudden he's gone and they don't know where he is. Have you ever felt like sometimes you're praying and God's not there? You feel like you were close to him before and now you're not? It's a great sadness. When you meditate on that mystery, she can heal that. What I'll do is we're gonna pray the seven sorrows rosary tonight. I'm gonna kind of guide us through a meditation on it, okay? And help lead you through some of those places. And we're just gonna ask the Lord to bring healing to each one of our hearts wherever we need it. Sound good? There are amazing promises for those who pray this rosary. One of the promises is that those who pray this rosary, they'll be healed of any addictions or compulsions. I thought that was remarkable. Because a lot of addictions are medicating ourselves for the pain that's in our heart, the things we've experienced in our life. So if you've got compulsions to do particular addictive behaviors, it's usually because we've had some pain in our life. And so this would make sense that if we have the wounds of our heart healed, we don't go back to those places. Make sense? So let's do this with Our Lady, and we're going to do it in adoration. So as we look at our Lord, and we pray and console Our Lady, we're just asking Our Lady to help us to receive from the Lord the healing grace that we, each one of us needs. Because we all have places we need it. I have places I need it. My brother's illness has been stirring up a lot of things in me this week that I was like I'd forgotten about. And that's what happens. Whenever we experience suffering, our stuff gets exposed. <laughs> And it's not pretty, but if we give it to the Lord, he's going to take care of it. And I believe that. So I'd ask you, if, if even if this is a new thing or if you're not necessarily interested, I'd ask that you'd enter into this time. And if there's somebody, if you're not experiencing things that you think you need help with, I'm sure you know somebody who needs help. So please lift them up. Sound good? And that way we'll intercede for each other and intercede for yourselves as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll prepare for adoration. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Get to a place where you're comfortable in a posture. If you, if you want to kneel, you can kneel. If you wish to sit, you can sit, that's fine. If you wish to prostrate yourself, as I mentioned, up here in this area in front, there's more space as well. If you'd like to, to do that, you can. Whatever posture is going to help you to remain recollected so you don't have to move a lot. Because when we move, we tend to 
to lose our focus. So be in a place you can be comfortable and sustain that posture for a while. Okay, sound good? Great, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Please kneel. Salutari sostia, quicelipandi sostium, bella premuntos nilia, dora berfer auxilium, unitrino quedomino, sit sempiterna gloria. Qui vitam sine termino, nobis donet in patria. Amen. Lord God, as we enter into this time of prayer, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us. Help us to have the right disposition. Help us to receive you. Help us to hunger and thirst for you. And Lord, we just lift up to you all of our needs, all of our family, all of our friends who have been asking for a miracle, who've been needing healing in their hearts. We ask that through the merits of this seven sorrows rosary, we'd have peace in our families, healing of our hearts, and healing of our addictions and our compulsions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most sorrowful mother, always remind us of the sorrows of your Son. The first sorrow of Our Lady, the prophecy of Simeon. 
This child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and you yourself a sword will pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Blessed Mother, we just ask that we would have the grace to endure in the midst of bad news. We would not despair, but we would see your confidence. For while you did receive bad news, you had hope in him that after the contradiction would come the glorification. After the cross came the resurrection. After your heart was pierced open, that it became a wellspring of grace for thirsty souls. Mother, help us console you as you dealt with bad news and help us, help us to not despair of our own. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, who was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, or without end. Amen. Most sorrowful mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The second sorrow, Mary and Joseph have to fly into Egypt, away from Herod. Blessed Mother, through Joseph, you both received horrendous news that someone was coming to kill your baby. You had to run, leaving behind everything in the middle of the night without any preparation to just go. You lost your comfort, your home. You had to go to a new place that you didn't know. You didn't know anyone. Didn't know what would come next, the uncertainty, the anxiety, the sorrow. Blessed Mother, we just ask that you would fill our hearts with holy love and confidence that you're going to carry us in the midst of places where we're going, where we don't know, or trauma from a move, or being in a new school, or not feeling like we know anyone yet confident that the Lord has us exactly where he wants us right now. Dear mother, sorrowful mother, we ask that your tears would bring healing to the places where we've been afraid. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We'll do this mystery in Spanish. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. La madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Y la madre de Dios. 
Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo, bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre Jesús. Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo, bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre Jesús. María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo, bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre Jesús. Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo, bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre Jesús. Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores. Gloria al Padre, al Hijo y al Espíritu Santo, como era el principio, ahora y siempre, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Most sorrowful mother, always remind us of the sorrows of your son, Jesus. The third sorrow of Our Lady, losing the child Jesus for three days. What sorrow filled your heart, mother? What anguish? Since the Annunciation until now, for 12 years, You've never been deprived of the presence of God, always seeing him face to face, experiencing him, touching him, having him touch you, hearing the word of God, loving him, caressing him, and he is gone, and he may never come back. Did I fail? Did I not do enough? Is he unhappy? What anguish three days, restlessly searching, pleading, have you seen him whom my heart loves? Mother, we just ask that you would intercede for us in the places where we feel that we've blown it all, we've lost everything, we messed up. Help us to know that your son isn't angry, that he's just waiting, he's right there. Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? Help us to run to him, to the father's house, so we can find him again. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. And lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Most sorrowful mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your son, Jesus. The fourth sorrow of Our Lady, Jesus and Mary meet on the road to Calvary. What agony to see your son carrying his cross, beaten, half dead, his skin falling off of his body bloodied and bruised, crowned with thorns, mocked, spat upon, insulted, when he did nothing wrong. How could they do this to my boy? How could they do this? How 
did they abuse him who deserved none of it? Blessed Mother, we just ask that you would heal our hearts from the place we've suffered abuse unjustly or we've watched it happen and have been traumatized by seeing it. Mother, may your tears wash over those places of our heart. Break the chains of our anger and of our resentment and give us the grace to forgive that we would be free, that we would no longer be a slave to the tormentors, no longer a slave to those who hurt us, no longer a slave to those who hurt the ones we love. May we be your children and be at peace. Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga a nosotros tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo. Nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en la tentación y líbranos del mal. Amén. Dios te salve, María. Llena eres de gracia. El Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. María, Madre de Dios. Nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Gloria al Padre, al Hijo y al Espíritu Santo, como en el principio, ahora y siempre, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Most sorrowful mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your son, Jesus. The fifth sorrow, the crucifixion, our lady standing by the foot of the cross as she watches her son die. Now it has come to pass what Simeon prophesied sign of contradiction on the cross, the Lord of glory and yet crucified. And as you watch him, the sword pierces your heart as the lance pierces his side, it pierces your very soul. What mother can watch as her son dies when she's helpless? The one who came to save us, the one who came to give life is himself crucified and it seems that all hope is lost. But yet you look at him and you see, this is not the end, although it doesn't make it hurt less. As you allow the tears to fall from your most, most precious and adorable face, may our hearts break open, allow us to weep for the things that we've held up inside, where we've been helpless and powerless. Holy Spirit. Help us to not despair. For your cross is not the end, the death is not the end. But we have to pass through it. Help us to endure so that we receive the other side of the sorrow. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, 
the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most sorrowful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The sixth sorrow. Jesus is taken down from the cross and laid in the arms of his sorrowful mother. How can your heart bear it? After seeing everything they did to him, he now lies lifeless in your arms. The child that you held at the crib, at the manger, the one you nursed at the breast, the one that you played with, taught him his prayers, and watched him grow, you now hold him dead in your arms. The tears flow freely. Blessed Mother, we just ask that you would pour out your tears over the places where we've lost loved ones and been traumatized, where we've lost loved ones so close to us. bring healing to our hearts. As we pray, we ask that you would bind up the wounds of our broken hearts in places where there's any despair or any place of depression. Help us to hold on to Jesus, confident that this will not be the end, even if we don't see it yet. Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga a nosotros tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo. Soy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en la tentación y líbranos del mal. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia. El Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres. Y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, hoy en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros los pecadores, ahora y en hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Gloria al Padre, al Hijo y al Espíritu Santo, como en el principio, ahora y siempre, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Most sorrowful mother, always remind us of the sufferings of your Son, Jesus. The seventh sorrow, Jesus is laid in the tomb 
and Mary prepares the body with her own hands. How can you let him go? To walk away must have torn your heart in two to leave him and to wait, to wait for the glory to be revealed that was promised. How grieved your heart was. It's so hard to let go of all those things we have no control over. So Mother, may your tears wash over us. Give us the grace to trust in God's providence that death is not the end, that this trial is not the end, this cross is not the end. That if we trust in you, you will bring about on the third day the glorious resurrection. May we not run away. May we not give up hope. Pray for mercy on all of those who have given up hope. That through the tears of your most holy mother, that their hearts would be softened, that they would not remain dead in the tomb, but that they would rise and receive the gift of faith again. Lord, we pray in particular for those who seem the most lost, for those who seem the most beyond hope, the ones we've given up on. Lord, that you would have mercy on them so that your glory would be manifested. I invite you to lift up as we pray this final decade anyone who has been heavy on your heart, anyone who has been enslaved to addiction, enslaved to resentment and bitterness, to anger, has rejected God, anyone who's on your heart that you want for the Lord to bring healing, we just ask Our Lady to intercede for them and for these tears to bring about a glorious resurrection in their life. And if that's you, offer yourself to him. Offer yourself into the hands of Our Lady so that she might be able to bring about new life through her prayers for you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most sorrowful mother, always remind us of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we be made worthy of the promises of Christ. 
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to enter into the time of quiet for a few minutes and receive from the Lord we've spoken. Now let's take some time to listen to our Lord of what he wants to say to us. Prayer is always a dialogue, a conversation. So let's conduct ourselves and let's place ourselves in a disposition to receive, whether that's seated, prostrated, kneeling, however you wish to do so. But let's enter into that time for a few minutes and just listen to the Lord as we gaze upon him.
Our Lord is so good to us, dear friends. Next week we have our homework being chapter 7 in the book, uh, the, the Bible Basics, or La Biblia Paso a Paso, Capitulo Siete. But more importantly than our homework, make time for him. Make time for him. Because we can study the word of God all we want, but if we don't put it into practical action in our prayer, then it won't save us. So let's make sure that we take the time to pray as well as to study the word of God this week. All right.